This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. This talk is with Andy Kesson of the University of Roehampton. Among many research accomplishments in early modern drama, Andy has recently assembled a team and secured a substantial AHRC grant to study bears and bear baiting in Elizabethan England. The project is entitled Box Office Bears. This talk is made possible with institutional funding from Aoyama Gakuin University and with the support of a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Well, hello, Andy. Hello again. It's been, a, it's been too long. It's been, it's too, been long. too long. And I think we go back. I'm, I think we've known each other because we've had similar research interests for you know, me for more years than you. But that uh, I don't know when we first met. It may have been in Canada. It may have been at Stratford, Ontario, that conference where we actually met face to face. And then you and Jimmy came through Tokyo not that long after that. And we went out and had some wonderful sushi with Ben Crystal. Right. And I had to leave early. Unfortunately, I had another and get and I really wanted to stay for that. But Ben was in town and what a nice coincidence. And then uh, I saw you again at that absolutely exquisite before Shakespeare conference is one of my fondest memories uh, of conferences, but also just memories. Those a few days over in Roehampton with those people. Uh, it's just the, the exactly the kind of people you would like to spend three days with. We had a blast and I, we learned so much. And I, for our, um, our viewers, what I want to do is start out, you're doing some things, you, you're doing a lot of work. And one of the things I want to feature right now is that you are doing a series of interviews sort of like these in a similar type of format but a little bit more of a kaleidoscope of people who are from various and sundry disciplines who are all very interested, uh, interesting. Before the show, I was going through a few of those and it's called a bit lit, a bit, B-I-T, lit, L-I-T. Now tell us a little bit about that in the future. Is it something you're going to keep doing or something that is for I don't know, pandemic purposes, because it sort of was provoked by the pandemic, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Tom. Um, it's re that's really generous of you. Um, yeah, so a, a bit that is a lot like the film series that you've set up here. Um, I, as soon as COVID hit, really, I felt like I was surrounded by all the people that I love worrying about the things that they love and whether they matter anymore. People asking, do the humanities matter? Does theater matter? Does performance matter? Does writing matter at a time of medical emergency? Um, and it seems to me that those things matter as much, if not more, uh, at a time of medical emergency. So yeah, a bit lit, which was set up with um, Callan Davis and Emma Whipday and James Opry and Matt Martin, not, not just by myself, um, was just aiming to celebrate um, those things and to give us a space, almost a space to meet for coffee or to meet if you were researching in a library and bumped into a colleague, just that sense of serendipity of who you, you might run into. And it was very important to us that we, we looked as widely as possible in terms of the sorts of people and the kinds of content that we might cover. Um, the three academics on the project are all early modernists. We all sit in the 16th and 17th century and we all look at English literature. So actually we're quite narrowly defined in terms of our research interests um, but it was really important to us we made that as as broad as possible so we've spoken to creative writers to performers of um, all kinds of different disciplines um, not just theatre um, and we've spoken to academics um, across a wide range of topics not as wide as I'd like it to be we always want to hear from other people who'd like to come and speak to us um, but yeah it's been really fun really fun project well, I see you're putting these out about once a week, and I I know from experience now that that's not easy. Uh, that's a that's at a pretty good clip, and uh, getting people set up and getting the timing, and also you're going through. I'm assuming uh, various like I am various time zones, where you you may have to wake up early or go to go to bed late. 
Uh, right now, it's your morning. It's my evening. And uh, as we talk, the sun will go down, right? And you will, you will have more and more sunshine, which is good. That's fine. That, that, that's the way it should be. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I fully agree with you. We're sort of focused on Shakespeare here because I'm on a grant. But one of the driving things behind this was, would be to uh, ex expose people and not just specialists, but expose people to who we are. Uh, there are misconceptions about the ivory tower, about us being maybe smug and uh, detached from society. And in your research, if there is anyone more engaged with the popular consciousness, not only now, but in the 16th century, uh, I can't think of anyone who is uh, in your work, you have really brought out the uh, drama before Shakespeare, and we're going to go to before Shakespeare in just a moment, but those elements that led up to an extraordinarily large and growing public reception that was set in place pretty much before Shakespeare got in there, and that's what he inherited and very much benefited from, uh, the, the people coming to the theater, but also the dramatic techniques that were developed during that period before Shakespeare. And I would like you to kind of recap your, your, your interest in this area before Shakespeare, what drew you to it and uh, what excites you about it, what excites me about it too. I might jump in at one point, but I think it's about the same thing. So tell us a little bit about that, if you may. Uh, well, I did my PhD on a writer called John Lilly, who is a contemporary of Shakespeare, but born 10 years earlier. And the thing that I found most challenging with that PhD was that just those additional 10 years, the kind of the, 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 the decade um, jump in kind of historical context, made me feel orphaned from the kinds of scholarship that we have on the 1590s and onwards. Um, and we do have some grasp on the 1580s when it comes to the theater. We think of Dr. Faustus and Spanish tragedy. Um, I think of Marlowe, who you've written about so brilliantly, Tom. But unlike the 1590s, it doesn't feel like we have a kind of a, a, a holistic, wide ranging knowledge of that decade. And then if we get to the decades before that, it just felt like there was um, relatively little scholarship and happening um, in, in wonderfully detailed ways. Um, David Kaufman is a great example of the kinds of brilliant archival work that was happening, has been happening in, in the earlier period, but no one really pulling, pulling things together and, and trying to take a wider, a wider view of the period. Um, and in particular, I don't really feel anyone looked at those, those theaters, those playhouses as a group and said, what on earth is going on there? So that was sort of my central research question is, why from the, at least the 1560s and even more um, strongly in terms of our evidence base in the 1570s, why do these public facing profit making uh, ventures start popping up in London? We go from zero to over 10 in a decade. I can't see it that happening anywhere else possibly on the planet in those years, um, and certainly not in Europe, even places like Spain seem to be a few years behind. And in somewhere like Spain, you tend to have one or two theatres per city. London suddenly has 10. And um, as I say, I didn't really feel like anyone was joining, joining up those dots. And I'm working on John Lilly, who works for, he wrote for a company of boy actors. And then thinking about someone like Marlowe, who's writing mostly for a group of adult actors, like, again, those dots are not being joined either. I don't think we have any sense really of how those theatre companies, um, how they operated alongside each other, what it would mean for a playwright to write for one or the other. Um, so it was a kind of historical and cultural geographic attempt to, to join those dots, really. Yeah, well, it's a great contribution to the, uh, the field of research, because you and I both know when you get into Shakespeare research that there's nothing, there's no stone that seems uncovered. And you, you want to make a point, and it hadn't been made before. Like if you're doing Midsummer Night's Dream, for instance, there's all of this stuff to go through and everybody, and there's this one little point, but you have to give cred to the people all the way down and it's exhausting. And so, <laughs> and, and then people will you know, maybe disagree with you. Now I do want to clarify for some of my students and so forth, the 1590s is when we, we're not quite sure precisely when Shakespeare arrived arrived on the scene, but certainly by mid 1590s and after those play years, there is a, a big bump and probably some things before the plague, but the 1590s. So you're talking about Lily who developed, and I think I'm saying this right, 
uh, primed the pump for a popular marketplace for shake for public or semi-public uh, theater, and also bringing to the uh, bringing together this relationship between court and city where you mm. can kind of uh, rotate, if not rotate plays at that time, you could, you, you, the finding that you can entertain groups in the city as well as at court, and that you can publish these plays, right? At a point that you've made uh, several times, and that these plays sold, they were popular. Mm. And that's what opened the market for publication of Shakespearean plays, which may not have been published, and we wouldn't have them. Uh, so that, uh, that's just an amazing contribution. Well, the, uh, the group of people you had at that con, uh, conference, uh, Hogersheim and, uh, of course, uh, Heather Knight, uh, they, they kind of, uh, uh, stole part of the show. There were some stole, show stealing moments. Uh, <laughs> there, there was a, a production of Galatia, which is a fairly obscure, even to people in the business, uh, it's not that studied that uh, you explored, you brought in a group of transgendered uh, acting troupe, and that play is gender bending as it is, right? So it's re-gender bended. And I'm, I got lost a little bit on, <laughs> on how many flips, you, you know, so it gets kind of mathematically complicated and <laughs> sort of uh, adorable that way, right? It was a, an excellent production and they led us from a room out into the woods there at Roehampton and we had to follow along with the actors. And uh, that was a wonderful, great moment. How is that troop doing? How are they faring? Uh, you know, almost post-pandemic. I, I can't imagine things have gone well. Yeah, we we um we've been in a kind of long period of um uh what's called research and development. So kind of um pre pre rehearsal really phase of the project for five years because we want to firstly we want to get the production right and secondly we need to raise a good deal of money. So we're not quite a troop yet. Um, the actors you saw, we have actors kind of coming in and out of, of the research and development process um, as we go. Um, uh, we hope to have that production on its feet um, next year. We're hoping to make a film of it, which will make us COVID proof, uh, we hope. And um, yeah, it's going to be really exciting, I hope, to, to, to stage this play. For, for my money, it's Shakespeare's favourite play. He never recovers from it. He's thinking about the gender bending you're describing in Two Gentlemen of Verona, and he's thinking about it in the middle of his career, like with As You Like It or Twelfth Night, and even a late play like The Tempest, the second scene of that play where a father explains to his daughter who she is and why she's where she is, comes straight out of the first scene of, of Galatea. So it's a play that Shakespeare never really recovers from. I sometimes think of it almost as a kind of um, creative trauma for him. He's always trying to, to rewrite and renegotiate some of the things that, that Galatea does. Um, and as far as we know, it has no stage history from the 17th century up to the present day, really. Um, and we're hoping to permanently reintroduce it to the modern repertory. So we're, we're hoping it will be a, a very visible um, production which might change conversations around Shakespeare, genre, gender, um, and also change conversations around, around diversity and inclusion, which certainly in the Anglo-American tradition at the moment tends towards including a single representative of diversity in an otherwise very normative and normal looking group of people. And our production is trying instead to center all the kinds of people who would normally be marginalized by those kinds of, of productions and ask what happens when we do that. And that, that's really important to me, I think. Um, so, so much contemporary classical theater makes us think of Shakespeare as expensive, fairly conservative, and I mean expensive at the level of budget and at the level of, of um, tickets. And of course, early modern theatre, those buildings were permanently in danger of falling down, permanently in danger of being shut down. Actors are semi-illegal. The stories that they're telling are very close to breaching laws about what you can say in public about religion or, or politics. So um, it's, it's really important to me that um, we start to rethink how contemporary performance makes us imagine Shakespeare, because I think, it, unfortunately, it sometimes gets in the way as much as it helps us to, to think about plays from that period. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It tends to eclipse uh, things before and after. And also, uh, it 
you know, uh, in the era, I guess from the late 19th century of the Shakespeare and academe and the departmentalization, the breaking up of uh, specialties and so forth uh, in, into academic disciplines. Uh, I think, no, nah, I don't know. I, I don't want to make a big deal out of this, but if you want to kind of survive, you better keep one foot in the Shakespearean area, right? And you can venture out. So, and there might be someone who uh, sees this uh, conversation and goes, well, I don't know how much Shakespeare was in there. And go, oh, quite a lot, because we're talking about sort of uh, primal I mean, reasons. We're going to the, to the source of what created this enormous thing. And I, I told another guest that, you know, you can't study rock, the history of rock and roll and just focus on the Stones and the Beatles. You know, you have to throw everything in there if you're going to do that. And I love the material approach you take to your research where you look at everything. You look at archaeology, you look at uh, print history, the nuts and bolts of how things were put together and where they were ge and the geophysical spaces, how they were used. And that's very challenging because we're getting not only out of Shakespeare, but we're getting out of the Department of Literature where we're supposed to be having revelations about what this sonnet really means again, you know, and and that's that's fun too but it just wasn't anything i think that ever engaged you or really engaged me to to be honest and uh, that's just it, it, yeah it's fascinating how when you start to engage with things like archaeology they start telling you very different things and um it was another prompt for before shakespeare really was that you know in the early 1980s we had zero playhouses and i'm not sure we were really expecting to find playhouses and um, as of last year, when um, a brilliant archaeologist called um, Stephen Wright uh, looks to have discovered the Red Lion, the earliest playhouse we know of in London, we probably now have all of the playhouses we ever expect to find. We may well find more we didn't know about, but we know all, we found all the ones we might expect to find. Um, so again, there's been a sea change in our, in our knowledge, and that knowledge has completely remapped what we thought we knew. So it, it tells you something there, I think, about things and stuff and physical spaces um, have completely disproven all of the narratives we've built up from words. Uh, so yeah, for me, it's always about bringing those two things into dialogue. Yeah, and I do, I do just love the way you're in London. So you have this wonderful opportunity. I love living in Tokyo. I love being here. But the uh, sometimes I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I have this feeling of uh, not, yeah, nostalgia, you know, from times that I've spent there, I've done some research and spent some time in London over my life and uh, wanting to get back there. And of course, it, it, during a pandemic, that, that feeling becomes even stronger. But I love the way that you, in, uh, as a scholar, as a, as a trained scholar, also engage with the acting community and engage with the theater history community. And th they're scholars also, but then there are a lot of other people who are floating around out there. Uh, and we're going to talk about your animal baiting in a bit, but you're working with people who do forensic science now. You work the cross-disciplinary nature in academe and then the outreach into avant-garde theater and uh, consciousness raising, social consciousness raising, raising through theater, and and just entertainment. What it's all about. We're supposed to have fun, right? Yes. Yes. If this, if it's not fun, we, we can just go back into the business community. You know, go <laughs> go go into the financial district and see if we can make some money there. Uh, and on that subject, I wanted to move a little bit because when I really got engaged with your work was with the Elizabethan top 10, uh, that uh, collection and that you uh, worked with with Emma Smith uh, at Hartford College, Oxford. And uh, she, she is so good at, at taking this, well, I don't want to say bear, but it is this sort of large animal of defining popularity what is that you know and i remember years ago raymond williams just came out and said uh well liked by many people and then you know that created well wait a second what do you mean by well like how many people and that kind of thing but you guys handled that subject extraordinarily well and it was revelatory to me what was popular you, you have lily right but you had the names of some other dramatists who really um Oh, uh, Thomas Hayward, that's extremely productive, and uh, other other things that were enlightening about that. 
uh, that search that you did into what texts were popular, were popular. If you could explain a little bit of how you approach the idea of popularity, it's a little, it's difficult, but uh, I think, yeah. Our, yeah. But yeah, the book was called The Elizabethan Top Ten and, and divided into 10 chapters. And really the idea was, if you walked into a bookshop in 1600, what might be next to Hamlet and what might be outselling Hamlet? Um, I suppose Hamlet's not in print at that point, so that's a bad example. But what would be outselling a particular Shakespeare play? And we were looking more at genres than we were at writers or particular texts. So we looked at um, wallpaper. Uh, there's a chapter on, uh, on wallpaper, um, prayer books, uh, psalm books, um, kind of how-to books, you know, domestic manual books. Um, Musidorus became the play. Uh, we had a, a chapter by Pete Cohen on, um, on Musidorus. So really attempt to, again, to, just, to redistribute the way we think about literature, popularity, et cetera, and, and to map out into a sort of real, you know, an imagined real space of a, of a particular um, bookshop or bookshop community. Um, and then I guess the theoretical point really, I think this is probably true of Emma as well, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to speak for her, but certainly for me, um, I really like engaging with questions which interest me, but I also feel skeptical about. And you were talking about how lots, you know, a lot of the debate is how popular and how many things do we need to sell? How many people need to read it before we count it as popular? Those sorts of questions happen in theatre history as well. I'm always amazed watching theatre historians com comparing one another's theatres and thrust stages. Who's got the biggest thrust stage? And I'm like, calm down, boys. We don't need to have that conversation in print. Everything's fine. Relax. Um, and yeah, I guess I feel skeptical about those sorts of, I'm interested in those methods of measurement, but also skeptical about them. And, and in a way the book was trying to move, not necessarily beyond it in a kind of quality way. We weren't trying to do a better thing, but just to, to sidestep some of those questions. And really just to, you know, those are not questions that are gonna animate someone in the 16th century going around the bookshop. Um, but but it, it was a case, as I say, of redistribution, I think, rather than recalibration. So what is next to each other? What kinds of contexts do these books live in amongst one another? What, what does it look like if we put Musidorus amongst psalm books, for example? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably, that's probably how most of my scholarship works is stepping away from numbers because I'm really bad at maths. And instead <laughs> just thinking about what might a real life engagement with these things look like? So just as I'm interested in before Shakespeare, the person walking down the street and saying, do I go to the theater? Do I go to the curtain? Did I, should I never have come to Shoreditch in the first place? Do I want to go back to the Globe down on the South Bank? Um, likewise, I'm interested in someone in a, book, a bookshop confronted with those sorts of choices. What do I do with my, my finite you know, pocket of money? What, what do I spend it on? Well, the, the, you, can't, you can't separate the two things. And I've, I've worked a good bit in recent years on the bookshops of St. Paul's um, of uh, Paul's Cross Churchyard and tried to, in my mind, you know, as a thought experiment to try to envision what you're talking about, a bookstore that is just like a bookstore. It, uh, you know, has sections. And so you, there's a lot of religious print and it's sort of, it's sort of dominant. Of course, it's dominant during that period. It's basically the reason that, you know, I, I, I believe that religious print provided the market for the popular print that also is being browsed you have these young gallants, maybe kind of like the two guys in Romeo and Juliet, two gentlemen of Verona, you know, all over Shakespeare, who are walking around. And I kind of envisioned them walking in public areas. And that Paul's walk, uh, you know, you had this wide space at the uh, churchyard and wandering into stores and being able to read here and there and everywhere, Shakespeare perhaps too, but also hearing, hearing the buzz, right? and getting a real, really good sense of the commercial market, kind of like we see directors like, like Clint Eastwood. He seems to have such an ear for what would be the story that would capture you know, lots of people. He, does, he seems to be doing it every time, and I can name any number of film directors who are just really good at that. And that's what excites me. And I think it's very much the, the same thing. This is an engaged uh, artistic community. They're not sitting in studies and reading through some classical text and getting inspired by the muse. They are, of course they are. The poetry is so fine, but 
without that public engagement and being part of it, uh, you just wouldn't uh, be able to bring that many people into that many theaters, right? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I am just delighted with all of this stuff, Andy. And I wanted to kind of move ahead here because I'm, I'm extraordinarily excited about bears. <laughs> I saw that and I've worked up, uh, you know, I was looking over your stuff. And just today I saw that you gotten a, a nice little slice of money uh, from the, uh, let's see, the AHRC. And for our non-British, uh, that stands for the Arts and Humanities Research Council, right. who were also funded before Shakespeare, so I'm very grateful to them. That's right. It's the same group, and they're a pretty generous operation. And you are working, uh, you're working on bear baiting in the 16th century, which is fascinating, and also politically and emotionally sensitive for many, many people in our time, you know, on, there's a spectrum, you know, of course, there, any, anything from hunters who at the, in the best case scenario, have a fair, you know, fair, fair shot of maybe wildlife management. And there's still, you guys were pointing out in your video, there's still animal baiting all around the world. And there's a famous, uh, re, not so old story about an American football quarterback who was in fact uh, convicted and had to, I think, go to prison for uh, dog fights. He was involved with dog fighting. And there's a lot of that going underground. And it, you know, there's a long history of this. And so just tell us about the project, where you are, uh, anything. It's fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Well, we're right at the start of the project is the first thing to say. And the beginning of the project has happened under COVID. So we're not really where we hope to be. And we've got another two and a bit years to go. We're running until August 2023. Um, so um, I think the project will start to accumulate. But it's a really exciting collaboration between um, some animal archaeologists, uh, some ancient DNA analysts, and some archival and literary scholars. Um, I was lucky enough to be approached by the bear archaeologist, best job title in the world, um, Hannah, Hannah O'Regan, um, on the back of before Shakespeare, really. And, um, you know, you were talking earlier about public facing work, which, as you say, is really important to me. And I think one thing we scholars often forget when they do public facing work is they forget that they themselves are part of the public and so are their colleagues. And actually, because we were writing blog posts on the Before Shakespeare website aimed at the public, they were being read by scholars in other disciplines who normally would find it difficult to process traditional theatre history simply because of where it's published, the jargon it uses, the assumption it makes about what readers know. And so um, before Shakespeare in the website opened up lots of collaborations with lots of different practitioners, but Hannah wrote to me on the back of that, which was wonderful. And in a way, it's sort of an attempt to do something like before Shakespeare to the baiting arenas to ask why they're there, why they happen, why then and why there. Um, and it's grown into a much bigger project, really asking about bears and animals in the early modern period. And in the first two months on the project, um, Callan Davis, who's leading the archival work, he managed to find um, two, nearly 2000 references to bears in Tudor and Stuart, England. And when we were writing the funding bid, one thing everyone kept saying to us is you won't find any evidence of bears. So there's no point even checking. And we've, we've just found thousands of references to bears. You couldn't move in early modern England for a bear. One of my very favorite facts is that bears regularly stopped traffic in early modern England. You know, people stopping their horses, stopping their carts, stopping walking on the street to stare at the bears. And there's a really great line in a John Lilly play, um, Mother Bombi. One character turns to another and says, are you there with your bears? Are you there with your bears? And it turns out the answer to that question is everybody was there with their bears. Bears absolutely um, everywhere. So we're having lots, lots of fun with the project. As you say, the act of baiting itself is not remotely fun. Um, deeply unethical, cruel sport, but just hugely popular and um, has been surprisingly um, understudied, I think, as a practice. There's some brilliant scholarship on it, but I don't think that scholarship has been integrated well into wider accounts of theatre history. And again, you know, I was talking about the person walking down the street saying, do I go to the theatre? Do I go to the curtain? You've got exactly the same options happening here. And I'm becoming increasingly fascinated in 
the South Bank area where you have the Globe and you have the Rose Theatre and you have baiting arenas. I think rather than that being a site of competition for audience, actually, you know, these places are acting as a, as a magnet for footfall, for people to come and to mingle and do all the things that we've not been allowed to do under COVID. And I, I almost wonder if we're really looking at an, an early example of a zoo or a, a, an animal-based fair, because not only have you got the baiting arenas, but you've got the kennels, you've got the ponds in which the animals drink and wash. You've got this site in which, again, you can come and look at the animals. So I think um, it's an incredibly important practice in the period. And one of the things we've discovered looking beyond London is that so many English towns actually have spaces for baiting right at their center. So the kind of, um, bear, if you look for Bear Road, in particular English towns, if you look for the Bear Inn, um, the Bear Inn seems to be where the baiting happens. It tends to be on Bear Road. Um, you can see how central this act is to the, um, to the English imagination. So um, that's what, what we're looking at. The ancient DNA analysis is aiming to find out things like um, the gender of the bears, um, potentially the, the breed of the bears, potentially where they're from. We can use things like um, dental records to think about their age and their health. We can look at bones to think about trauma marks and therefore to think about the kinds of combat that they're engaged in. And then we're hoping to put that all into dialogue with how baiting is imagined in the period. Um, and baiting is deep into the heart of the way Shakespeare thinks about certain characters, particularly at the ends of plays. Um, famously, Macbeth um, ends the play um, just comparing himself to a baited bear. Gloucester in King Lear, as he's about to be blinded, says, I am tied to the stake and I must uh, stay the course. Um, so characters in Shakespeare repeatedly compare themselves to a bear being baited. Um, so there are, there are just an awful lot of stories to be told there. But the last thing I'll say, and you're welcome to ask any more questions, of course, but we're also, just like with before Shakespeare, we're keen to work with contemporary practitioners. And in this case, we're working with a group of professional wrestlers because we want to think about what it is like to perform combat in front of an audience. Um, one of the things you do if you, if you run a bear baiting um, as, a, as a practice, we actually, Tom, we actually have found... Um, the diary of a bear ward. So someone who owned a bear and was traveling around the country, we're able to trace this man for two months around England on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes on an hour by hour basis. And that the two bears he had, the, these poor bears, are being repeatedly baited, not just across days, but across months. So the last thing you want when you're staging that is for the blood sport to become actually um, uh, dangerous to the point where the bear can't fight the next day. So these are staged managed, performance events. So we're going to work with professional wrestlers. Professional wrestling grows out of much the same logic, really. You know, if you're making money from being a fighter, you need to be able to make money as a fighter the following day. So introducing levels of performance into what you do is the way to, to make that happen. Um, so those are the sorts of ways in which we're approaching baiting. I don't quite know what we're going to find, but I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, you just said several things, and uh, I have that, you know, I could go on about 17 things right now that have just uh, entered my mind, but I was always under the impression that the bear uh, died at, at any given event, that they would bring in enough dogs and that the bear died, but these are sort of gladiator bears that can survive a given event and probably were expected to survive, and there must have been some there must have been some talent out there, like the uh, the famous bear, just like you have the famous wrestler. Uh, and so they were used, the, the bears won typically, apparently. They, they, they uh, tended to make it through and killed the dogs and then lived to fight another day. Yeah, so bears, lots of bears become celebrities. Um, fascinatingly, a lot of the, of the bears are linked to particular places. Um, in England. So it's almost like um, a bit like football in the UK now, people cheering on for their team, cheering on for their local bear, perhaps. Um, certainly lots of dogs will have died, but, but actually the archaeological evidence of the dogs, and again, we're just at the start of this project, I should stress, but um, we have found hundreds of dogs. And the, the thing that surprised our archaeologists is just how old the dogs are, mm. and that there is evidence that when bones have been broken, they have been reset by humans. So we are seeing a history Firstly, we're seeing a history of cruelty, but we're also seeing a history of care. Um, and so that's surprising too. So there may have been stage management around the dogs as well. These are massive dogs, mastiffs, for which yeah. England was famous, 
going back to the Roman period, and, and there's a real cultural association of Englishness and Mastiffs kind of predating the more familiar association between England and the Bulldog. Um, and so the dogs too may well have been cared for and their safety may have been managed as part of this sport. Well, the small amount of research, and this is just, I have not done specific research, but it's in reading something else and somebody's going to bear baiting and invariably in uh, three accounts that I can think of now, the word pleasurable was, it was very pleasurable, just like going out to, I don't know, see a, a light comedy or something like that. You know, that there was great pleasure. I imagine in a good football match, that there's that feeling of, particularly when your team wins, uh, that that feeling of pleasure and joy, uh, and you guys were talking in your video on this about betting, and so I guess there were some people who were pulling for the bear or how long the, it would take for the bear to win, which or what and other people with the dogs, but anyway, they seemed to have a lot of pleasure, and there were I do remember something where a monkey was involved, and everybody got a lot of joy out of seeing a monkey riding on a bear's back. Uh, and that was just that stole the show or, or it just seemed like that from what I was reading. This is wildly good. And you have an article on this, the performing animals in the in a journal of animal history and literature. I, I'm not saying that correctly. Is that... Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a book on um, literary animals. Um, literary animals. Came out, it came out before the project, I should say. So it's not really about bear baiting. It's actually about dogs on stage. I should say the project's called Box Office Bears and our website, so if anyone's interested, uh, boxofficebears.com is the place to look. We're publishing primary documents up there, transcriptions and photographs. We're making some animations about some of the stories that we're discovering, um, particularly around bears on the streets in England. And the, the big, actually one of the biggest discoveries of the project so far is how often bears accidentally get into people's houses terrifying right um we keep hearing again and again about bears um you know being let loose by the bear ward they lose control of the animal and it just it just goes into somebody's house terrifying absolutely terrifying when i was in hiroshima years ago teaching there at the at hiroshima university uh one day i just you know looked at the uh news or the paper and it was big news up in the mountains and hiroshima is a million people this was a large town by our standards, and in a, a suburban area, just a little bit outside of the city center, not far, you could actually walk it. Uh, and there's this gentleman, uh, a grandfather, that would say OG sign in Japan, he's sitting and it's on his tatami mat, you know, very traditional, having his bowl of noodles or whatever, and a bear comes flying through. <laughs> <laughs> and and mauls him it, he, he wasn't killed but he's hurt and the bear was looking for food and I'm going, what do you do about that you know so i don't know this is a, a a little bit off topic but i do remember the pictures in the paper the next of the hiroshima hunting club they had to go out and get their rifles and these were guys and they hunted the bear down and killed the bear but uh um uh, <laughs> I could talk about bears all day, but we'd run out. We would run uh, out of my uh, expertise. Uh, I wanted to look at so pretty pretty quickly, uh, except that there there are a lot of them still, and they are a growing population near where I grew up in South Carolina in the mountains mm -hmm. uh, above there in North Carolina. Lots of black bear, uh, which aren't as threatening as these you know grizzly you see in the movies and so forth. But there is a public fascination with bears. They're always is and of course there 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 are great examples of people who you know have their pet bear and and think of bears as being happy and nice and uh, no they they can get really rough with you very quickly. You did some work uh, in the past on uh, London theatrical culture. I think that was for that, that's just an overview, fifteen sixty to uh, fifteen ninety. So you've established yourself as an expert in that. Uh, period of time and you, know, you talked a good bit about the 1580s and uh, and John Lilly and of course there's Robert Green the University Wits are coming on and they're um, uh, but the 70s is a little bit more obscure and the 60s more obscure although we do know that there's a theater activity so I have not read that article I will I promise you soon <laughs> 
but I'm dying to find out what you had to say about the 60s, the 1560s and 70s that are not as well documented as, uh, as the later decades. Yeah, um, I think the first thing to say is that we, we start hearing about theatrical activity. Um, I mean, theatrical activity in general, we start hearing about as soon as we start hearing about English, English culture, right back to the Roman, the Roman period. Um, we start hearing about things which sound a little bit like professional troops and potentially um, sites for regular performance as early as the late 15th century and early 16th century. So it's something which predates even the 1560s. Um, what we hear about in the 1560s in particular is um, the Red Lion Playhouse, which I mentioned earlier, which um, we, think, we think we now have discovered thanks to Stephen Wright um, and his team at, at um, University College London. Um, and we didn't know about the Red Lion until the 1980s when two documents were discovered, which were the proprietor, proprietor John Brain um, taking to court the carpenters responsible for the scaffolding and for the stage, so for the space for the audience and the space for the actors. And um, that evidence has not really been, again, that well integrated into theatre history, but when it has been integrated, scholars tend to think of the Red Lion as a transient space, which is only open for a matter of months. We have no evidence either way about that. And um, actually, I suspect the archaeological evidence we found last year is going to tell us that the Red Lion was open for possibly for decades. Um, so I think the really crucial thing to stress again and again is that we don't know much. And when we do know about things, scholarship's reaction tends to be to reject or to downplay that evidence in favour of what happened in the 1580s and particularly at um, playhouses associated with Shakespeare, like the theatre. And I think once you stop doing that, and you take all of your evidence much more seriously. As I said earlier, I think the really crucial thing is that we get more than 10 playhouses opening by the late 1570s, which is, is itself extraordinary. Um, one of the most important take home messages of the project for me has been that um, there are women at the top of the leadership structure of at least half of those playhouses. Um, so women who own or rent um, in playing spaces, for example, um, Anne Farrant at the Blackfriars Playhouse, the Indoor Playhouse, um, and people like Margaret Brain, who's the wife of John Brain, not only does she help to finance the building of a theatre, when the project runs out of money, she literally picks up tools and is one of the carpenters helping to build the theatre playhouse. And about five years later, the Burbages um, beat Margaret Brain off the property by broomstick um, whilst hurling, hurling abuse at her. And so we can see in this early period, firstly, um, the centrality of female entrepreneurs to setting up these spaces, but we can also see marginalization happening in real time in the period. We can see women being ousted um, from, from their own property by a family so strongly associated with Shakespeare later in the form of the Burbage, um, the Burbage family. So those are the big um, take home messages for me. I, I really do think those spaces are remapping what you can do with your body in leisure time in London and what you can do with your mind. Um, yeah. These are these are places which are staging, as I said earlier, stories which are deeply illegal at the level of religion and, and politics. Um, and something like close to half of London, I think, must have been going to the theatres regularly to keep these places in, in business. London is growing, but it's still a pretty small city. And to have these 10 playhouses regularly playing to public audiences that suggests there's almost a level of radicalization going on, I think, at the, at the level of um, the creative imagination, oh, yeah. uh, the possibilities of what life might look like as these theatres start staging, you know, stories about Middle Eastern tyrants, about ancient Greek queer people, about atheists, about necromancers, um, extraordinary. And I, I just don't think we've quite taken for, take, uh, understood yet what a sea change that is, which is occurring in the middle of the 16th century, crucially, not at the end, uh, but in the middle, um, as Elizabeth I comes to the throne, not, not towards the end of her reign. So it's, it's, it's about remapping and re-historicizing that moment, I think, for me. Well, also, I was talking, I, I, I spoke recently with Heather Knight of mm -hmm. MOLA, who's one of your uh, dear friends, yep. and they've been working on the boar's head, and they date that to the 60s, too. And again, I am, have not completed any kind of research on that, but there's activity there. And, it, you know, it's sort of like 
uh, I don't know. There's an old adage. You, you see a mouse in, you, in your house and you get rid of it in whatever way. And you figure, well, I got rid of the mouse. If you see a roach, you assume you have more roaches, right? And I don't want to compare theaters with roaches, but it's a sort of <laughs> the, sort of the same thing. I mean, if you have one, two, and you this certain schools of historiography would say you can't speculate beyond what we have physical evidence of but yeah you can because if there are two of them there are probably more venues out there and more people entrepreneurs just like you would see in any college town in the united states you have a, a guy who opens a little bar and he has live performances and there's local bands and so forth and sometimes the venue lasts for three months they don't make it sometimes it goes for years you know like the marquee club in london you know it just keeps on going and going and uh and so mostly i think these theaters were fairly ephemeral but they probably if you lived during that time it, uh, they, you, you went there. And, uh, and secondly, I wanted to talk about what, you know, the, the, in, the process of enlightenment, it reminded me of, you know, my, my father was World War II, and he just despised all this rock and roll long hair stuff, you know, going back to the hippie period. And, uh, but you know, I'm getting things on the radio and hearing this stuff. And I've been trained as in piano and we play Bach and all of that stuff. And I, I didn't play French horn. I, I was in classical music. I loved it. Hmm. But, you know, when you first start hearing Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Motown, uh, all of this stuff, I'm like, wow, you know, and it may have been something like that, that finally, not finally, but instead of going to a, say, a small town pageant or a mayoral show or something, you have this innovative theater out there and they're dealing with material that is not church. Mm -hmm. It is not church stuff. And that's where you have your public gatherings for people to worship. And you can see how uh, ministers very early on saw this as a threat, maybe even financial threat, you know, I mean, you, you want people to give tithes at church, you don't want them throwing all their money away on theater and all the things that go with it, right? Yep, absolutely. Financial threat and an imaginative threat as well, you know, um, yeah. a, a priest wants, a priest is speaking to your, your imaginative ability to engage with the stories in the Bible, and the stories, the wider stories of of the of whatever iteration of Christianity they're speaking for, and if you suddenly have playhouses um, telling you to imagine other places and things, then that's a it's a threat of your hold, um, not just on their financial but their imaginative resources as well. I think that's right. And um, the uh, the anti theatrical sermons, which object to the theatres, almost always also object to baiting and betting. Uh, so again, you can see how those those things exist in a kind of continuum for people who are worried about them. Yeah, well, that goes on to modern times, you know, where you have to have special uh, dispensation to to have a casino. And uh, the famous examples in the States of saying, well, you can't have it in the state, but uh, I don't know if it's 50 or 100 yards, you can build a basically a large raft. And that's, uh, that's the water. That's not the state. So uh, that's, that's happened in a lot of cases. And of course, Las Vegas and so forth. But we still don't have, um, even though a lot of people enjoy gambling and betting and so forth. I was fortunate in that when I was young, I bet, uh, and, you know, just in a bar, you know, when I was in college, I, I bet a couple of times on uh, a sports match here and there. And every time I did, I lost. And I said, you know, this isn't for me. I can't pick a winner. But if I've won one of those, you know, you don't know where that's going to lead, right? But uh, I have friends who just love it, you know, and they go out and play golf. And uh, you were talking in your little program with uh, on your website with your uh, colleagues there about uh, one of your colleagues he, uh, was talking about how uh, microcosmic, right? So, you know, you've, you're bet, you bet, golfers will bet on who's going to win the hole, but then you get up there and say, okay, will I get out of this sand trap in one? Or, you know, let, let's throw a couple of dollars, you know, if, if it's in the States on that. Uh, but yeah, the, um, the uh, morally upright, you don't see that as being a part of the, uh, of the work ethic they would support and having a stable, civilized, uh, sober, uh, humble culture. 
you've done a little work on digital humanities, and that's one of the subsets of this program. Uh, and you have an article on uh, digital humanities and non-Shakespeare. What's going on there? <laughs> I have to say that it's just a small write-up, really, of yeah. what we were doing on before Shakespeare. And in a way, I mean, I'm, I'm an embarrassingly non-technical person um, and not not good with anything digital. So I, I'm always a bit embarrassed to even suggest like I work in this area. But it really goes back to what we were saying earlier about for me the importance of speaking to a public a public audience. And I do think that getting boxed into a certain set of expertise is actually really intellectually unhealthy. If you're only ever speaking to people who have the same assumptions about you, about primary material, secondary material, methodology, all the things we speak to our research students about all of the time. If we if we box ourselves in in terms of what we think matters, then we stop seeing why it matters, I think. And I guess a, a lovely example of that for me is that I'm now thinking about bears, which, you know, I haven't really thought about bears that much in my professional life. And it's very humbling for me. You know, here we are, Tom, speaking on your brilliant um, series about Shakespeare. You know, bears, very few bears read Shakespeare. He's, he's not particularly popular amongst the bear community. Bear, some of them have not even heard of him, which is a shame because there's a great pun to be had in kind of like a shake bear, right? Um, but, you know, just being asked to, to rethink something you take for granted as central um, from the point of view of something which is entirely indifferent to it and has no idea what it is, is a healthy thing to do. So I'm, I'm a huge believer in the digital humanities in that it opens up a space to speak to people who do not share your assumptions and do not share your expertise and are useful to you for precisely those reasons. And we do tend to think of scholarly communication in terms of expertise and it's the expert who changes the listener. I'm much, much more interested in speaking to people who will change my questions and expertise in their, in their own right, which is why I love working with practitioners. It's why I value working with wrestlers. Um, it's why I value working with anybody who does not think that John Lilly, for example, is the centre of the universe. I mean, if I only spoke to people who thought that, I'd have a very lonely life anyway. So, um, yeah, for me, it's about it's about collaboration, um, pooling expertise, pooling resources. Um, and as you said earlier, making it fun, because there really isn't any point in doing it other than um, for that reason. And I've never really been interested in being the lone scholar. Um, I tend to say this quite often, but, you know, I don't really like working with myself. I know all of my best jokes already. Um, and tragically, I know all of my worst jokes already as well. So why would I bother? I have no interest at all in doing that. So for me, it's all about conversation. And I think really, I'm not convinced I'm much of a researcher, but I definitely think I'm someone who opens up conversations. I like doing that. I like hosting conversations. The Elizabethan Top 10 is a nice example of that, I think, you know, bringing in people who didn't really work on popularity per se, and who didn't really necessarily, weren't necessarily literary scholars, but asking them to um, collectively think about this question from various points of view. Yeah, that for me is a good microcosm of what I like to do. Whether that's digital humanities or not, I don't know. As I say, I, I wouldn't put myself forward as a digital humanities expert, but for me, the digital terrain, the digital platform is useful because it, it just opens up a world which tends to be quite closed, quite hierarchical and quite structured. And I like not having those things. Yeah, well, really what drew me to digital humanities was the fact that I am remote. You're there, kind of in the center of things. And I'm in Tokyo and years, some years ago, I've been here for years. And we just, uh, we just couldn't get the, the materials that we needed. And then over time, I see more and more materials coming out and I have more and more access to it. And I got involved with the uh, JADH, the uh, Japan Association for Digital Humanities. And they are doing all kinds of different things. You know, they're looking at uh, boys love and Japanese manga and uh, how and, and games, video games, and even going, you know, getting theoretical about, you know, what is violence? Is it violence if it's so campy, like you have sort of in a Tarantino film, you know, and talking about some fairly um, uh, very topical and hot issues down to how, how do we write this type of programming? What a kind of platform we're going to use, that sort of thing. But I've attended their conference. I've attended papers that for 20 minutes, I had absolutely no idea what anybody was saying. And they're speaking in English, you know, and I'm going, I don't know. And then go to another paper and something really exciting happens. But you get that 
uh, sense of community with someone outside of the Shakespearean realm, and then that transferability that comes in where you see these fields and how they're intersectional points where everybody has really, if you, if you go to the base, very similar interest. You know, I, I don't know, you were talking about the, uh, um, a, a little bit about the life of the mind, you know, but we're fascinated about history because there is a fantasy element there that is also reality, right? And we can re rebuild it in our mind. But I do think that uh, in, a, in a time when we are very focused on identity and you know, who we are, that uh, this, this study, there's so many pivotal moments in the 16th century. And of course, the dramatic uh, uh, upsurge was part of it, that we, we, see, we see that in our lives now. Is part of a, an, a process of identity, of, of knowing who we are. You having grown up uh, in, in Southern England, I believe, and, uh, and uh, what you schooled at Manchester and uh, Kent, and, uh, and I'm growing up in the American South, right? And, and there's some years that separate us, but you know, we run into these people all over and you see all of them having made this kind of turn in their life to get interested if it's not our field or 16th century, 17th century, it's something similar and transferable. Well, I had here a note to ask you about your future. And uh, I, do want to, I do want to ask you, I do this with every guest, I was talking a little bit about your educational background, but you're a bright guy. You know, you're in school. You said you weren't good in math, but uh, and neither, was, <laughs> <laughs> neither was I. I have a colleague uh, in literature who was excellent in math, but uh, it's a joke with my students. I said, I'm not going to put these numbers out here about your averages. You just, you know, can take this home and ask your uh, younger brother or older <laughs> sister, somebody who's good at the... Uh, uh, at this, but I want to find out if there's something, you know, okay, you're a bright guy, you're in school, you're doing pretty well, right? And uh, you're having to choose in England, probably much sooner than in the States, you're kind of having to choose your class, dropping classes early on to focus. When did you think you were headed into the humanities direction? Um, probably always to the humanities. I, don't, I can't really remember when I first started seeing shows um, both, both kind of Shakespeare style theatre, but also musicals, but probably when I was 12, 13, something like that, and just loved it. Absolutely fell in love with it. Um, did a little bit of drama at school. I actually ended up writing probably very bad plays. I had a reunion with two old school friends a couple of weeks ago, and one of them, to my astonishment, still has some of her speeches from a play I wrote when I was 16 in her head. Um, and I, I turn, I'm turning 41 in October. So this is many, many, many years later. Um, and uh, I haven't thought about this play since 1996. And she started reading the speech off. So, you know, you and I as, as theatre scholars talk about how plays circulate, where they sit, how they get printed. But there's an example of a play which I haven't looked at on paper for decades, but it's just sat in her head and she was able to trot it out. Quite, quite astonishing. And, Word for word, I even knew it was word for word, even though I'd forgotten it. I knew that she was getting it right. So um, there's an example of how plays can circulate decades later. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yes, I, was, I definitely was interested in, in theatre and performance um, and didn't really know what to do with that. At school, I was really lucky that I was encouraged to read. I'm, I'm from Canterbury, so I'm from Marlowe land. I'm also from John Lilly land, but nobody knew that because no one cared about John Lilly. But I was encouraged to read Marlowe. Um, and I was a, a queer kid, um, not necessarily that aware of being queer um, until I was probably about 16, but I was encouraged to read Marlowe. And, you know, there is Edward II, this extraordinary play about um, a gay king. And I was, I also, um, for my A-levels, for my exams, I read Duchess of Malfi, um, which is another way, you know, extraordinary way of thinking about early modern sexuality and a defense of an exploration of um, sexuality in the guise of a woman demanding to be allowed to marry the woman she, the man she wants to marry. Um, and I, I just found those plays much more exciting than the Shakespeare plays I was being asked to read. So right from the start, I kind of was intrigued by that difference that Shakespeare's on this huge cultural pedestal, these other writers were not, but actually I was much more drawn to, to the other writers. Um, 
I didn't want to go to university. I was really adamant that I would not go to university. And um, mm. I actually taught in, um, I did a teaching English as a foreign language, very uh, basic course and went to teach in China in Qingdao, not too far away from where you are right now, Tom, mm. um, and taught out there for six months. And then there was some illness in my family and I came, came home and um, my dad said to me, I don't know if I should be saying this on camera really, let's, let's agree, no one's allowed to listen to this bit. Uh, okay. But my dad said, don't be angry with me, but I called up Manchester University and I pretended to be you and you've got a place to go to university <laughs> if you'd like to, because we want, we want, you, to come, we want you to come home. <laughs> so I went, I went up to the university to look around and um, there was a new theater opening up called Contact Theater, which um, was the UK's first theater, um, explicitly targeting young people and people who are traditionally excluded from the theater. So thinking about um, socioeconomic background, thinking about race in particular and taking theater out onto the streets and into communities. And I, I walked into there and I came out with a job and I remember saying to my dad very ungratefully, I said, well, I've got to go to university now, haven't I? And then for the next four years, I did my undergraduate degree and I did my master's whilst working at contact theater, which I just loved. I worked as a front of house manager and I worked in a new writing department working with um, young playwrights and writers and had the most fantastic time and by the time I was 24, 25 my life very much felt like I could either keep working in the theatre or keep doing academia um, and I, I uh, was lucky enough to get funding as a PhD student to work on, on John Lilly and off I went but I was really anxious but that meant I was saying goodbye to the theatre but actually what's been wonderful is I brought the theatre with me and I'm kind of coming back to the theatre now so i'm sort of answering that's a very long question a long answer to your question but always knew i was going to work in the humanities didn't quite know how and to be honest even now i don't quite know quite know how i've recently gone part-time as an academic and i'm thinking about other kinds of careers i might have so even um going into my 40s it's not quite clear to me what academia looks like as a profession for me anymore and i'm looking forward to trying out other other ways of making a living um, and I'm making sure I do say that as part of this conversation, because I think so many other people in our profession feel like that as well. And it's something which is weirdly taboo. I think it's, it should be OK to say that here I am in this profession. I'm having a good time. But there are other professions out there. And it's important to see what other features we might have um, alongside an academic one. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Yeah. Uh, you said you just turned or about to turn 41. Yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, almost uh, almost exactly dead on the same age. We left Hiroshima and huh. came back to the States. And I, I said, I'm going to branch out. And I met with, uh, I won't say dismal failure. failure. <laughs> it, there were times there where I, uh, uh, you know, in the old movie, Raising Arizona, where the guy slows up by the uh, at the convenience store because he's addicted to robbing. a I slowed up. I'm not a robber, but I was thinking there was a help wanted sign in there and I might be able to make a little money on the side in this convenience store. And it was beginning to look like I was going to have to do something like that. And uh, although I did manage to maintain myself as a sort of independent contractor. Now, I was not in London. I was in a, a medium-sized southern town. And so when this job came here at Aoyama Gakuin, uh, my brief excursion out into the world, <laughs> you know, I'm hearing you know, all this incoming fire and go, okay. Uh, and this job has been just such, such a heavenly appointment and so stable and so good. And the colleagues are so good. And, the, the, you know, in the middle of Tokyo, everything just fit together. But I had a lot of questions before I came. And I fully understand what you're talking about. And you're in London and multi-talented and have a lot of associations. I mean, not only in terms of, uh, of getting involved in the theater and going, uh, doing that sort of thing, but there are a lot of different types of jobs in the arts and the humanities that are well-funded and that, uh, you know, there, there are lots of opportunities. So uh, I, I, uh, I wish you the absolute best. I don't th I have no doubt that you will just succeed uh, tremendously. Uh, but I do want to say for our listeners that the, in, in Japan, we have not been hit hard by the economic downturn uh, uh, that caused by the uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, universities in the UK have been hit very, very hard. And that and they're, they're scaling back. 
and it, it's just a numbers game. They don't care if your name is Andy or if your name is Mary or if your name is Mark. You know, they uh, they uh, have to figure out and configure a way to keep the the uh, institution going with far less funding. Is that right? They, they have has been a major cutback. And I think that's the case in a lot of universities in the States. And I may be speaking too soon about us. And there are, probably, there are a lot of people who aren't as well, as equi well equipped to make a transition as you are, uh, mm -hmm. for, certainly. And uh, well, I had something about the future here. I can see bears in your future. Now, <laughs> that, that grant funding stands, uh, regardless of uh, you're still affiliated with Roehampton and a uh, beautiful, wonderful place when I visited there. Um, and I'm sorry to hear that Roehampton and along with I'm sure many other universities have had some problems, but what 900,000 pounds that you guys have, and that's well north of a million American dollars. So that's a substantial grant that is in a project that has all kinds of potential in terms of public engagement. I mean, when you get down to it, who isn't interested in bears? <laughs> and you already have the controversy built in because you know there's going to be some group of uh, twiddly d twiddly dumb people who get upset because you were even bringing up the idea of animal cruelty, right? Good. That's just, <laughs> just like you know the uh, the the, fun, the fundamentalist Christians who come out and scream about your movie, and then everybody goes right. And of course. Of course, none of us believe in animal cruelty, but how fascinating to see the difference between the way they saw it and the way, I mean, if you and I went to a bear baiting show, I think we'd throw up and leave within five minutes, right? It would just be too horrible. And, and maybe, I don't know, you, you know, call up the cops, right? It's, it's against the law for- Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, um, I think- the two, the two responses that I get from the project, the two negative ones are, are the one you just talked about. And by the way, if anyone's listening and, and are offended, please write to Tom and not to me. Um, but yeah, um, the, the people who are, who are furious that you're even engaging with it as if it's somehow the way to deal with it is to pretend it didn't happen, which I, I find a very odd reaction. But then also the kind of the view that you're describing, Tom, which is clearly just legitimate in lots of ways of saying that now we're very, we're very different now in our approach to animals. But, but I do worry about that as well, that, you know, safari is a big thing and people desperate to see the kill when they go on safari, people watching animal programs and watching them hunt one another. Um, and how much children's television is essentially about animals fighting um, from things like the Transformers movies, which, you know, they were around when I was a kid. Those robots turning into animals and fighting, not just animals, but we do see animal combat actually quite a lot, I would say. Lord of the Rings, full of fighting animals, um, so I think it is, it is oddly still central. Dog fighting is still a very big thing and quite a big part of, of gang culture, I believe. Um, and YouTube, you know, unfortunately, having put films up on YouTube about bears, now YouTube recommends to me extremely distasteful films, um, most of which look like they're CGI and they're fake, but um, of, of animals fighting or eating one another. So there, there is still, unfortunately, a, a strong appetite for want of a better word um there's you know people still want to watch this so i don't know how much we i don't know how much we have changed i think what's changed is that humans tell one another they care about animals which i don't think they did as much in the early modern period oh. but whether we're right about that i don't i don't really know i'm sorry to end with a negative thought but yeah i, I wonder if it is as true as we think that we have changed that much uh listen that's down a couple of tiers you think of the treatment of women the treatment of uh, anybody who would uh, uh, be of any non, what do you say, traditional sexual orientation, you had to be extraordinarily careful about that. But you had to be careful about if you were a commoner, how you spoke to a gentleman or somebody of rank, you had to be careful about a lot of things. And uh, I don't think we have time to go into this now. Children were not viewed as children. I think they were viewed as young adults. And of course, there's you know, uh, stories of uh, what we would consider to be child abuse. I don't think, you know, we, we won't get into that because there were there was an, an incredibly influential artistic movement that in, involved boys companies uh, and that propelled all of the drama, I think. Of course, Hamlet complains about it, but I think if you really looked at it, uh, Andy Kesson style, 
through the market and so forth, that like you said, one, one group propels another group. It just creates more and more public interest and so forth. Well, what I want to do, you've given me far too much of your time on your Monday morning, Monday morning. And uh, thank you so much, Andy. We are delighted. I wish it were you uh, in person, in the flesh. I'd love to uh -huh. see you. And I'd love to see Jimmy again, uh, like we did a couple of years ago in Tokyo. And I see it in your future. I see it sometime in, in the future and maybe not so distant. Yeah. But uh, again, and, and could you stay just a moment uh, after we finish? But I wanted to thank you so much for uh, taking time to speak with us and my uh, largely Japanese audience, but growing international audience and, <laughs> and globalizing Shakespeare. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.